Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. This is Jesus speaking. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. If you were asked to buy the tackiest gift imaginable, what would you buy? Martin Marty was once invited to a post-nuptial party. He was asked to bring a gift in the worst possible taste. The purpose, I don't understand why, but was to embarrass the newly married couple. They would open their gifts standing in front of their family and friends in ooh and awe as they opened each tacky item. Marty found a five and dime store and began his search for the tackiest gift. To his delight, he discovered a yellow plastic dove with a silver beak hallowed to hold a small plant and chain so that it would, could be suspended. This was the perfect gift for the occasion. He thought no one would have a more ratty gift than this. Then an amazing thing happened. Expecting to be embarrassed at the checkout counter, he was instead surrounded by shoppers. They wanted to know where he had found such a beautiful gift. Two or three more of those doves got sold that day. Marty walked away wondering where such things come from and where they go if the neighborhood store does not manage to sell them. Later, he found the answer in an article in the Wall Street Journal. They were reporting on the tackiest trade show in the nation, and it was being held in none other than Las Vegas. <laughs> Over 4,000 manufacturers unloaded cheap or surplus merchandise at unbelievably low prices. The reporter interviewed some of the merchants at the trade show. One merchant told him, everything's got a price. Another jokingly said, I'm the last guy you see before you take it to the dump. <laughs> Another said, the less you know, the better. Still, another told the reporter, grunge is in. 
And finally, another summed up the experience with these words, everything can be sold. What we do with what we have been given says much about our understanding of faith. Think of it in this way. God has given each of us a gold coin, and it is our choice on how we are going to spend it. We could spend it on junk, for grunge apparently is in, or we could spend it on ourselves, or we could bury it in the ground, or we could invest it in the kingdom of God. Now some of you may be thinking, okay, here we go. She is finally getting to the guilt-producing sermon that always comes at the end of every stewardship series. But I can assure you that guilt is not the reason that I selected the scripture passage for this morning. In fact, in order to prove that to you, I'm going to invite those of you who have not submitted your commitment cards for 2017 to do so. If you did not bring one and would like to complete one this morning, we will have some available at the end of the sermon. The only thing I want to say to you before you fill them out and turn them in is this. Thank you. Thank you for an amazing year of ministry and mission service, and discipleship. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your generous giving from the heart, and for your desire to work hard to determine how and where God is inviting us out there to help change the world in our community and beyond. I doubt many of you remember this, but we started out our year exploring the ways to get fit for God. We talked about what that looked like for our spiritual, physical, financial, and relational health. I'm not going to ask how any of you are doing on these, because I know that these are a lifelong commitment with many ups and downs, many highs and lows, many successes and setbacks. And guess what? You don't have to take a break as we go into this holiday season or wait until next year to get back on track. If you have indeed temporarily gotten off track or even lost your way. What better time than this crazy holiday season that is upon us to remember that we will begin preparing this Advent to celebrate Jesus' birthday and not our own. I know some of you have December birthdays, but still the focus will be Jesus. And nothing would be make Jesus happier than for us to make time for him in the days and weeks to come. Nothing would make Jesus happier than to indulge in a few less goodies and to spend more time at the gym than at the mall. Nothing would make Jesus happier than to spend less money on 15 gifts that will be forgotten in a day or two, possibly more on one gift for a child in need in our community. And nothing would make Jesus happier than for us to focus on spending quality time with our families, our co-workers, our neighbors, or even the stranger in our midst. And you know what? makes all of this a little bit easier? Thinking back to our Lent and Easter experience this past year, where we immersed ourselves in the challenging but inspiring Gospel of John. Those six weeks before the glorious celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we worked hard to hear Jesus' call in the book of John to believe in him and to abide in him. We spent a considerable amount of time attempting to understand and affirm the spiritual significance of Jesus' life. Together we explored the questions of identity and meaning of Jesus, and in the process, I think, began to clarify what we do believe about the one whose birth we will celebrate in just a little more than a month. And as a result of all that hard work, I think that by the time we got to Easter, we were more ready to accept Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. 
and to accept that it does make a difference in our lives as well as out there in the world. By the time we got to April and May, we tackled some rather challenging topics. We dealt with doubt, even in the midst of all this good news, which is often exasperated by the politics and division in our nation, as well as in the United Methodist Church. I can't thank you enough for allowing Shane and I to talk about the challenging landscape of our denomination, including how it is shrinking, or what I hope and believe might be right-sizing, how it is bitterly divided over the topic of human sexuality, and how much our growth is overseas in parts of the world that are radically different from us here in the U.S. And yet, obviously, even here in the United States, we are not all on the same page. I know that many of us were very disappointed with the results of General Conference, or should I say, the lack of results. But the Council of Bishops is likely to call a special General Conference in 2019 after the Commission on a Way Forward grapples with the Church's teaching on homosexuality and church unity. Yes, a church divorce may be inevitable, but I keep praying for an amicable one as opposed to a contentious one. So thank you again for hanging in there and not giving up on the United Methodist Church, and more importantly, for staying committed to this United Methodist Church, including its mission and its ministry. I hope that our summer series on the fruit of the Spirit helped you to do so at least a little. For how can we go wrong when we allow the Holy Spirit to be the primary force in our lives? And when we do, I truly believe that we can and will continue to produce the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that we can make a difference in the world. That is certainly what I saw at work in McGoffin County, Kentucky this past summer when we took the largest group ever in the 31 years of ASP involvement here at Faith, which was only possible because of your extravagantly generous giving from the heart. As a result, eight families not only gained improved living conditions, but hopefully also experienced the love of God through the 57 of us who were blessed to participate. I know we sure experience the love of God. And because of your continued faithful giving from the heart in 2017, we know we can count on you. So we are already planning our next ASP trip and another trip to Juarez in October. In August this past year, we took advantage of the Summer Olympic Road to Rio. And much like January, pause to remember that our faith journey in discipleship takes constant training, is best done in a team, and will always include many victories along with some defeat as well. But we made a commitment to press on toward the goal, including the goal to determine exactly where it is that God is calling us out into our community to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. This fall, you opened your hearts and your minds in an attempt to rediscover the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as a result, we were able to learn about the many needs in our community, as well as embrace and affirm a number of ministries and programs that are doing everything they can to meet some of these basic needs. Those ministries included Cradle to Career, the Daily Bread Soup Kitchen, See You at Home in the Phoenix Center, Salt and Light, Courage Connection, and Habitat for Humanity. Right in the middle of that series, over 60 of you gathered for a visioning retreat on a Saturday morning to talk about, to pray about, and to discern where God is indeed calling and leading us outside the walls of this building. 
the well-being of families and men's homelessness rose to the top as two concerns that we have as well as two places where we might be ready, willing, and able to get involved. And we have wasted no time. I thought we might wait until after the holidays to get to work, but no, that is not what has happened. Last Saturday, one of the cradle-to-career teams held a symposium for youth at risk right here in this building. They heard speakers from around the community who spoke on such topics as job skills, relationships, managing money, and achieving success. The theme was 3D, listen to this carefully, decisions determine destiny. And we even made it onto the back of their t-shirt as a primary sponsor. <laughs> we are right there at the bottom, front and center. A couple of weeks before that, about a dozen of you helped get Habitat House number two framed up and ready for the winter so that we can come alongside those two deserving families and other servants throughout the interfaith community to complete both of these homes this spring. On top of all of that, at Charge Conference this past Monday, we agreed to do whatever we can to help provide shelter, emergency shelter for homeless men in our area from January 1st to March 31st. Fortunately, our brothers and sisters in Christ at New Covenant Fellowship are, we think, willing to be the host church since Daily Bread Soup Kitchen will be moving out of their building in December. But we are planning to function as the umbrella organization that will take a major part in coordinating this effort with a number of other churches and organizations in our area who are on board already as well. That will include helping to raise the $40,000 we need to make this all happen including hiring a director and some assistance, providing some insurance and liability coverage, and volunteering whenever and wherever we can. Not sure that you have the talent to do so? Then allow me to focus on the passage of scripture for this morning for just a moment. You knew I would get back to it sooner or later, didn't you? Like many of you, it is not my favorite passage in the Bible, especially the wicked, lazy servant part. Of course, I love hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. And yet I realize that kind of praise and affirmation does not come for free. Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Master. He has a right to demand something of us and expect something from us. Jesus told this parable to illustrate this truth. Every follower of Jesus Christ is to be both a servant and a steward. Each and every one who calls themselves a Christian has to be doing something for God as a servant and to be stewards by being faithful in using the gifts that God has given us. It is not so much about what you have that matters. It is about what you do with what you have. God is not concerned whether you have great ability or little ability. God is not concerned whether you have great talent or small talent. God is not even concerned whether you are flush with money or not. It is what you do with that talent, with that ability, and with that money that matters to God. Every one of these servants in this story were expected by the master to maximize the value of their gifts and talents that they had been given. Someone once said, and I believe said well, that the danger, the great danger is between the things that we think are too small for us to fool with and the things that we think are too great for us to attempt so that we wind up doing nothing at all. I want you to remember something. No talent is too small, no task is too trivial, and no gift is too small if it be, can be used in the kingdom of God for the glory of God. 